and welcome to this week's edition of the OTTX Wednesday webinar series. I'm Eric Hansen from OTTX, and on behalf of all the team at OTTX, I want to thank everybody for to welcome everybody today, and thank you for joining us to the series where we bring you insightful, thought-provoking presentations across a broad spectrum of OTT-related topics from thought leaders across our industry. Today, we're excited to have with us Ramon Breton and Tom White, two executives from Third Eye Digital, a pioneering company in the field of quality assurance for the media and entertainment industry. Ramon is Chief Technology Officer at Third Eye Digital, and during his tenure, he's helped expand Third Eye's capabilities and to include evaluations of high dynamic range material, 4K UHD resolutions, immersive audio formats, virtual and augmented reality experiences, and UHD Blu-ray discs. Prior to his 15 years at Third Eye, Ramon spent 10 years in the music business as an audio mastering engineer. Tom White is Technical Operations Manager at Third Eye Digital, and he leads IMF Creation. He is a 25-year veteran in the motion picture industry, uh, motion picture and TV post industry. His career has spanned the transition from film and tape to the exclusively file-based environment we all work in today. As a leader in areas of quality control, editing, file creation and delivery, and data I.O., he has helped some of the most well-recognized companies in the industry adapt and innovate in the continually evolving media industry landscape. We also want to thank Third Eye Digital for participating in our webinar series today. Third Eye have been great supporters of OTTX, including many of our events and as active members of discussion sessions and working groups. So I know we're all Looking forward to the presentation today entitled High Dynamic Range, UHD, and Immersive Audio in the OTT Age. So with that, I'll invite Ramon and Tom to join me on stage and we'll get things kicked off. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Joining us. Gentlemen, how's it going today? It's good. Morning. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for jumping on. Um, I think we're ready to roll. So I'm going to take off here and turn the uh, stage over to you. Thank you. Okay, so let me get my presentation shared with you all. So first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. We know you are very busy, so we appreciate the time that you're spending with us. Thank you to Eric and the OTTX for hosting us and for having this webinar series. It's been great watching these webinars these past uh, few months, especially since the pandemic hit. It's been a good way to stay connected and to learn something as well. So today we're gonna try and keep it somewhat brief. Uh, we know everyone's sitting in front of their computers doing a lot of Zoom meet meetings lately. So we'll try and keep it concise and to the point. And uh, today's presentation will be two parts. First will be an overview, which I will deliver, and it will just give a kind of basic idea of high dynamic range, UHD and immersive audio, and how that's having an impact on OTT and digital, especially now in the pandemic. We'll pause after that for some questions. Then Tom will come on stage and we'll go into the technical requirements. And we're thinking, you know, if there's anyone in the audience who is considering delivering HDR or UHD, if you're a content owner and you haven't done that yet, that hopefully you'll learn something today about what's required to do so. We'll also, of course, go into the importance of QC, not only for these kinds of files, but just in general. So first I'll go into just a little bit about Third Eye Digital. We have over 25 years of experience in third-party quality control. We QC master files, Blu-ray DVD discs, VR and AR applications. We also do IMF packaging and other file creation and transcoding services. And we leverage our exp expertise in real-time QC as well as automated QC, depending on the needs of the project. Originally, Third Eye was known for master tape QC when DVD first became a thing, we were approached to help launch the catalogs of Paramount, MGM, and Fox. So we really established a name for DVD QC. When workflows moved to digital, with the transition to the digital workflow, we moved our uh, mastering QC in-house, which was 
a good thing. It let us get a lot more flexibility for our clients instead of having to rely on when a facility was available. And it let us build up our equipment in-house so we could offer that as a service. Soon after that, we joined the Netflix Preferred Vendor Program, which was also a good thing for us because Netflix has always been very cutting edge. So it helped bring us with them whenever they wanted to get into something new like 4K UHD resolution or HDR, Atmos Audio, all of those things we built our studios along with when they decided to roll those out. We work with major studios, but we also work with smaller clients, uh, really helping shepherd projects along for people who have never delivered to someone like Netflix or any of the platforms before. We help them understand exactly what's required and um, what's important and what's not important. So let's start with something we already know. Now, it seems like every webinar I've attended in the past six months has pointed out something along these lines. So I think we all know this, but right now, OTT and digital consumption is up because people are at home more, they need something more to do, so they're watching more TV, basically. Uh, Nielsen's total audience report from QT, Q2 of this year reveals that streaming video is up 25%, or it's not up, excuse me, it's not up 25%. Streaming video accounts for 25% of TV viewing, whereas the last measurement in Q4, it was 19%. More significant to me is this, this note right here, that 25% of adults added at least one streaming service in Q2 2020, while only 2% eliminated a service. I think that's very key because, you know, as more original content comes out on the different platforms, it's driving people to subscribe to, say, CBS All Access or some other service that perhaps they hadn't used before. So let's get into just briefly what UHD resolution, high dynamic range, and immersive audio, what these things mean. Now, I, I think the vast majority of the people watching right now, I know that you all know what these are. So we'll, this is gonna be just an overview, especially with UHD resolution. I think we all get the idea that it's four times as big as HD. Um, it's also known as more pixels. This way of illustrating it is helpful for me. So if we look at, you know, if we imagine this is SD resolution and we add in HD resolution, we understand what that change was like. And if we now add in UHD, we can see just how much more of a palette we have to work with, just how much larger those files are. And I always look at this and think, you know, instead of upscaling, imagine if an SD broadcast was presented pixel for pixel on a UHD television, it would literally be as small as that white frame in the center of the, of the picture. That's not the way I would wanna watch SD content. So let's look at, let's look at HDR. Another way of saying HDR is better pixels. So again, I'm going to show you these slides. Tom will go into a little more technical details when he presents. But if we look at this picture here, this is a representation of a standard dynamic range picture. In and of itself, it looks fine. There is nothing wrong with that image. It looks pretty good. But when we look at an HDR representation of the same image, we see that not only are the blacks blacker, not only are there more details in the blacks, not only is it overall brighter, not only is there more color in the brightness, but look at the overall color pal palette. So there's a lot more to see. And I think for consumers, an easy way to describe HDR isn't necessarily more contrast, wider color gamut. I don't know that they're gonna understand those things, but what I think they do understand and what is plainly visible is that the picture is brighter and the picture is more colorful, not in an unnatural way, but in a way that actually looks more natural. And seeing these pictures side by side, it reminds me of two things. It reminds me of seeing the Dolby Vision demo at CES when they unveiled it. And they literally did something similar where they had an image on a monitor, an excellent monitor, and then they had the same image on the HDR monitor behind a curtain. <laughs> and they literally, you know, parted the curtain so you could see, oh, 
the glory of the HDR picture. And it really was, it was quite amazing. It reminded me of the first time seeing HD broadcast at a Best Buy. So just walking through a Best Buy and seeing a football game in HD for the first time was one of those job dropping moments of, I need to get this, whatever this is, I need this in my living room. And for me, HDR is similar to that. Speaking of Best Buy, so it, it used to be, it seems like just a year or two ago, what people said was, pretty soon, if you're looking to get a large television, chances are it's going to be a UHD set. Well, now that is definitely the case. And it's not even an extremely large television. So just a recent survey on Best Buy's website, it was very difficult to find a single 45 inch or larger television that was not UHD. The only thing I could find were two low end models and they were both in the 45 inch range, but anything above that was UHD. And the other significant thing I noticed when I did that search, it was also almost impossible to find UHD sets that did not have HDR. So it is now becoming hand in hand. When you buy a UHD television, it's gonna have HDR. And if you're looking for a television that's 45 inches or larger, it's going to be a UHD HDR television. So let's take a look at immersive audio. There are two main formats, Dolby Atmos and DTSX. Dolby Atmos seems to be the one that's far more common. The significant thing about immersive audio, some people hear immersive audio and they assume it just means speakers in the ceiling. And it, it kind of does. But the more significant part about it is that it's object-based instead of channel-based. And what that means is, if you think of the past, if you think of a 5.1 setup, if you wanted to have a helicopter fly around, you would mix it so the helicopter would be, it would start off maybe in the front in the center, and then it would be mixed so the left speaker would have more helicopter, then the left surround would have more helicopter, and so on, to make it pan around the viewer. But with Dolby Atmos, with immersive audio, when it's object-based, they take an object, in this case it would be the helicopter sound, and they place it in a 3D space, including above, wherever they want it. So the helicopter can maybe go like this, you know, maybe from the, the front right to the back left above the viewer. And instead of that being actually encoded in the channels, that object has metadata that tells it at any given time what position in space it's supposed to be. So what happens when that track is played back for the consumer, if the consumer has a setup that has speakers in the ceiling, then some of that sound will come out of the ceiling and it'll sound like the helicopter is going up above and it'll sound a lot like it was intended to sound by the, by the producers. But if someone, let's say, has a 5-1 system but doesn't have speakers in the ceiling, it will still be decoded and represented as much as possible. So in that case, it will go around the viewer from front right to back left. It won't necessarily go above. And the same is true if this, from a, for a user who's playing back a Dolby Atmos file in their television. It'll just move from right to left in the television speakers. So the point is, with the object-based audio, it's interpreted by the setup that it's being played back on. Here's a couple of examples of typical Dolby Atmos home setups. And I'd say the one on the left is not as typical as the one on the right, but the one on the left, it's a 5.1.4 system. So the 5.1 would be, would be center, left and right, left surround, right surround. So that's the five. Point 0.1 is the subwoofer, and then point 0.4 would be these upward firing elements. So right here, these speakers actually have two elements. They have an element that's uh, projecting this way, then they have an element that's projecting this way up to the ceiling, and then it bounces off, giving the impression that the audio is coming off of the ceiling. Now, another 5.1.4 or a 7.1.4 Another setup that actually has the upward elements, what they call the height channels, 
uh, would actually have speakers up in the ceiling. But, you know, it just depends on how dedicated the consumer is to having something like that. If you look on the right with the sound bar, that's much more common. And it's an easier way to get uh, an Atmos set up at home. So Dolby Atmos at home is becoming much more common. So approximately 25% of UHD television features some sort of Atmos playback. And many sound bars out also have Atmos playback. Now I put those in quotes because how does a television have Atmos playback? A lot of it is just simulated. Um, for example, the LG television that I have has Atmos playback. And I can't say that it sounds like it's coming above me, but I do hear that they're making an attempt to make it sound more immersive. But I think the point of this slide is that something like Dolby Atmos doesn't have to be completely understood by the consumer. It doesn't have to be just for the audiophiles or the home theater aficionados, or even just the slightly above casual viewers. I think what happens is if someone goes to play a file, let's say from Netflix or from Amazon or from the Google Play Store, and that Atmos button lights up or shows on their screen the indication that this is an Atmos file, I think they recognize that as a special feature. Something exciting just happened. The Atmos just came on. This is going to sound really good. So what does all this mean? So right now, the new home viewing experience, in terms of resolution, luminance, which is another way of saying brightness, brightness and dynamic range, the quality of the home experience can easily exceed what consumers can see in a theater. So the average movie theater puts off about 50 nits, while a consumer UHD HDR television can put out 400 nits or even more than that. A nit is a measure of brightness. And this is a very, very real thing, even with a 55 inch television, but especially with a 65 inch or even larger. Uh, I was in a movie theater one time watching a 3D showing of a high frame rate feature, it was The Hobbit, and the fact that it was 3D cut down the brightness as well, having to wear the, the glasses, but it was amazing to me just how dim the image was coming off of that screen. Now, that's not to say that all home, you know, that all theatrical experiences are like that. I personally love Dolby Cinema, and I will see a movie if I really want to see it. I'll, I'll spend the extra to see it in Dolby Cinema because it does look amazing and sounds amazing. And going to theater is still a viable option. It's still a night out. It's a way to get out of the house. It's still a social event. And I know right now we're not really going to the theater, but um, hopefully we will be. So what is all this equal? So consumer expectations. Right now, we know there's more home viewing of streaming content. We know there's more UHD and HDR televisions. And right now, most movie theaters are closed. And all of that leads up to consumers expecting high quality home experience. They went out and purchased this 55 inch or 65 inch UHD HDR television. They got an Atmos soundbar. Now where's the content? What can I see that's gonna really show off this television I just purchased? So right now the OTT and digital content owners are finishing premium and even not so premium original content in UHD and HDR and in many cases with Dolby Atmos Audio. When Apple TV Plus first announced their original programming, they stated their intention that all of their original content would be in UHD, HDR, and Dolby Atmos. A recent survey of Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney Plus shows just how many UHD and HDR titles are available from those services. And plus we have services like Fandango Now, Vudu, Google Play, and they literally offer hundreds of titles in UHD and HDR. So the content is out there, the consumers have the equipment to play it back, and the consumers expect to be able to see it. And not only that, but, but I for one, when there's something I wanna see, I know that I'm disappointed if it's only available in HD or if it is UHD, but it's not HDR, which honestly is, is fairly infrequent these days. Even with the content, if it's UHD, it tends to be HDR. So that was the overview. And I know we had discussed 
having, I'm going to get my chat window up here. If we're going to have some questions at this time. Yeah, Ramon, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for starting at the basics because uh, for me anyway, that was really, really helpful. I really appreciated your, uh, your description of uh, even, even, you know, like UHD and, and HD and SD, something like you said, we talk about all the time, um, but to visualize it the way you described it was really, that was really helpful. Um, I think I'm going to have to up my game though uh, when it comes to my, uh, the, the, the screens that I have in my house. Um, so now you're giving me some ammunition um, to, to go, sh go do some shopping. Um, one of the things that I think um, I'm interested in is why is it that, um, well, the, the, the numbers are as low as they are. Um, you, I think it was like in the 200s or something for Netflix. Netflix has obviously a, a whole bunch more content than that. Um, why, why aren't we seeing a whole bunch more, do you think, uh, titles that are in UHD and, and HDR? I'm sure we'd all love that. Or those of, those of you who have the, the, um, the uh, devices to be able to play it back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's two things. One, that number is, if, if it's a series, it doesn't matter how many seasons that series is, it's only re represented once okay. in that number. So that, that multiplies it a lot. And number two, Netflix has a lot of original content, but a lot of that is, a lot of their content is still acquisition content, and they don't really have much control over that being UHD, HDR. So I think right now, you're just only gonna see that number increase. And um, like I said, with their original content, they're trying to do as much as possible in UHD and HDR. And, and also, it needs to be pointed out that one thing that's overlooked a lot is HDR brings a lot to an HD image as well. So there are some, typically we see it with animated shows, they'll be finished in HD, HDR, because the, the, the cost of finishing in 4K doesn't necessarily outweigh the benefits with an animated program in some cases. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you put an, an, uh, an animated show on a good looking television, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be 4K in order for it to look really amazing. So that's, that's another option as well. Yeah, South Park looks like South Park. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> Although that'd be pretty cool to see a, a, a UHD HDR South Park episode, I guess. Um, yeah, now um, Third Eye, y'all are in the, um, the, the QC business and, and transcoding. Um, I'm interesting, interested in some of the challenges maybe to how um, as we're moving into bigger files, more complex, um, especially with HDR, how, how do you determine whether it's right or not? Because it's just more colors, but is this the right colors? Sure, yeah, and that, that's something Tom will definitely speak to. We'll let Tom speak to that, but I can speak to at least the challenges of upgrading our infrastructure to, to those files. So. For me, the, the biggest factor in when we first just made the jump from HD to 4K was, okay, I understood that the files would be bigger, but just to be able to play a single frame, one frame at a time of uncompressed 4K video, that's a lot of data to be moving around. So it's really that drive access time on the playback system. That's where it was pretty mind boggling that we had to really invest in some, some pretty heavy duty equipment in order to get that done. Yeah. And, our, you know, and, and like I said, Tom can speak to the challenges of, you know, the QC of, of that kind of content to making sure it's correct. Um, but a lot of that is, you know, we have good partnerships with people like Dolby who can, you know, we can get all the best practices from them and they can assist us in understanding what's the best way to evaluate, evaluate something like a Dolby Vision file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the files are big and they're expensive too. Um, you know, they, I think that's one of the things that that can be a little bit um, inhibitive, not necessarily prohibitive, but um, for, for a platform or a retailer that's, that wants to make that content available, they're, you know, they're, they, they're really big. Um, the, the, the mezzanine files are expensive and it takes a lot more uh, CPU to, and, and just you know, overall resources to process them. And so, yeah, the, I think that you know, um, the, the kind of the ROI on having those higher fidelity um, content available for customers, it, it will improve as the cost of um, uh, attaining them and processing them um, continues to go down. So that's something that um, we can, we can, I think we, we see that in our industry. It's, it's something yeah. that happens and it'd be interesting to see what's um, kind of the status of that. 
All right, I, well, I think it has happened too. I think it, it's become a commodity. So I, I don't know that you could even go to a finishing house right now, a post-production studio and say that doesn't have 4K available, let alone HDR at this point. So because everyone has it, the price is naturally coming down. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually remember when HD was like, you know, wow, HD, that's, that's real expensive. Those mezzanine files, that's, those are big. You sure you want those? <laughs> All right. So um, let's turn it over to uh, Tom now. To, let's get, let's get technical, Tom. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, we're going to get a little bit technical. We're going to do technical light. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next slide. Okay, so everyone participating in this webinar uses the term UHD and 4K daily, multiple times a day. We all know what we're talking about, or we all think we do. Um, so what I wanna cover here is just the difference, the actual difference on the ground between the two terms. Um, people use them interchangeably and they're not exactly the same thing. So let's dive into what the difference is. So UHD, when someone's talking about a UHD image or a UHD file, each individual frame is 3840 by 2160 pixels. So that is the actual size of each frame. That works out to be 8.3 megapixels per frame. So think of think of an hour worth of UHD content as being 86,400 8.3 megapixel stills. Um, at 24 frames per second, an hour of content is 86,400 frames. In UHD, each one of those frames is 8.3 megapixels. So a pretty large still photo. Um, and UHD is the consumer display and broadcast standard. That 4K television that you bought in the last couple of years is not 4K, it is UHD. Um, the salesman at the TV store threw the term 4K around a lot, but the TV you have at home, uh, even if it's brand new, is in all likelihood 3840 by 2160. If you have a professional 4K television at home that is actually 1.90 to one aspect ratio, then salute. You paid $20,000 for your TV, good for you. Anyway, so that's UHD. 4K, true 4K is 4,096 pixels by 2,160. So, it is about 10% higher resolution than UHD. There is a format called 4K, but when you view it on a UHD television, which is the television you have at home, it's slightly matted at the top and bottom because the aspect ratio of your TV at home is 178 to one, not 1.90 to one. So when you view 4K content on your TV at home, you will notice there are mats at the top and bottom. That's so that the original aspect ratio image fits inside your television. Um, as a post-production facility, as, as a facility that receives files in both UHD and 4K, they are delivered as IMF packages. That's becoming more and more the norm. As Ramon pointed out, we're a vendor for Netflix and uh, we create IMF packages for them. Um, so files can be delivered in UHD or 4K as an IMF, as a file type called DNxHR, that's an AVID file type. If you're finishing on AVID Media Composer, you're probably outputting a file called DNxHR, or of course, ProRes. Um, no matter what, the file type you're receiving or delivering, they're going to be large to massive. Um, IMF packages are a little bit smaller because they're, there's a greater rate of compression, um, but even in SDR, so no HDR involved, we're talking about the Rec. 709 color volume, 60 minutes of runtime at 10-bit and 422 color sampling you're looking at about a 360 gig file. 
Um, so a one hour ProRes at 10 bit 422, a ProRes HQ is going to be about 360 gigs and that's large. So if you're talking a full two hour feature, you know, you're sniffing a terabyte of, of data, you know, you're getting there and that's formidable. So as both Ramon and Eric pointed out, we're talking about, um, you know, scaling up file size wise. Next slide, please. All right, so HDR stands for high dynamic range. Anyone participating in this webinar works with HDR content. You use the term daily. We talk about it all the time. What does it mean? As Ramon pointed out in his slides, it means a much brighter image, a much more contrasty image, and a much greater color palette. Literally, there are thousands of more colors than are available to you in SDR. The, the, the two primary HDR color volumes, which are P3 and Rec 2020, they are by orders of scale larger than the Rec 709 color volume. Um, so it's a lot more colors and a lot brighter and more contrasty image. So the two main uh, HDR formats are HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Um, they both use the PQ transfer function. We don't need to go a lot into what that is. Uh, the main differences are in HDR, the metadata, the script, the, the, the SDR trims that tell the image how to look on a standard SDR TV screen are static. You set a high and you set a low and that's for the whole program. And the file size can be 10 bit. In Dolby Vision, that SDR metadata is active. The colorist can choose to create trims at every shot if they so choose. And the file size is minimum of 12 bit. So those Dolby Vision files are gonna be a little bit bigger. Um, the increased color volume of HDR increases the file size as we keep talking about, and it presents some unique challenges, which we'll get into in a minute. Next slide, please. All right, so what does it take to master or to color grade in HDR? Well, I mean, basically it takes the right tools and the right personnel, just like any job does, but specifically for HDR, um, just like doing color in telecine back in the old days, you need a controlled environment where the lighting is, is controlled. You need little or no ambient lighting uh, in that room, in that suite that you're setting up to do HDR mastering and color grading. You need an HDR reference monitor that's capable of displaying a minimum of a thousand nits of brightness. Um, 4,000 nits would be ideal given today's technology. Um, as Ramon talked about, a nit is just a measurement of light output. It's literally a measurement of how much light your screen is transmitting. So a thousand nits is kind of the base HDR target. 4,000 nits is reaching the maximum capabilities of even a professional monitor. Um, and then you need a tool that can create these files. And we use DaVinci Resolve as our example here, but there are many tools out in the marketplace where um, wide color gamut or HDR color grading can be done and an HDR file can be rendered and output and the accompanying SDR metadata that drives the SDR color grade can also be output from the same tool. And then you need someone who knows what they're doing to run that tool. So a colorist with the expertise in working in expanded color spaces and professional colorists with many years of experience are still learning and getting their feet wet with what wide color gamut formats can do. Um, we've all sort of been given this Ferrari of HDR 10 and Dolby Vision and there's this massive contrast ratio and there's this huge palette of colors to work with. And even professional colorists are still learning what it can do. It's like 
I'm going to take this out of first gear. I'm going to take this out of second gear. I want to see what this technology can do. So we're all sort of learning how to drive this exotic car called HDR. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, I'll just touch on Dolby Atmos because Ramon's overview was so comprehensive and so good. Um, Dolby Atmos is a 3D, if you want to think of it as a 3D surround technology. Besides your traditional 5.1 speakers, there are the height speakers, as we talked about, um, where audio that is supposed to be spatially overhead actually sounds like it's overhead. It's object-based and those objects, up to 118 different audio objects, can be placed in the 3D space in the room you're listening to it in any place that the metadata is programmed to send it. On the post-production side, on the technical side, as someone who's going to be handling this content and delivering it to an OTT platform, the things you need to consider, one of the things you need to consider is Although audio files, even Dolby Atmos files, are still small compared to, let's say, a 4K HDR video file, they're, they're many times larger than a, than a traditional audio file, whether that's, you know, discrete stems or whether that's audio mux within a ProRes. Uh, a two-hour feature in Dolby Atmos can be 85 to 100 gigs, which is massive for an audio file. So again, just like with UHD and HDR video content, we're talking about these orders of magnitude increase in file size and the need for storage capacity. It's the same thing with Dolby Atmos audio files. You're going from a three or four gig, you know, folder that's, that has 5.1 discrete wave files in it to an 85 to 100 gig, you know, um, ADM B wave file for Dolby Atmos. So again, it's it's you must have the capacity to store it and to move it across your network and to move it across the internet. Next slide, please. All right. So what is needed technically to handle all of this stuff? Well, again, as I said before, you need the you need the hardware and you need the personnel. So when it comes to hardware, you need playback editing and rendering tools that can handle and create a wide variety of file types. So you may be delivering to an OTT platform that still wants a ProRes file with audio muxed within that file and an XML sidecar that drives the Dolby Vision metadata. So if it's a UHD file in Dolby Vision, you're going to be talking about hundreds and hundreds of gigs, if not up to a terabyte, depending on the runtime of the show. So all of that data requires a large amount of storage capacity. Um, that's internally, depending on your SLA with your client, you may need to hold on to the source files that created the deliverable for months, and you may need to hold on to the deliverable for years. So you're talking about many, many terabytes of storage that you'll need to archive material, potentially. Uh, when downloading, receiving, or delivering these files, you need a secure high-speed internet connection that can, it, you need a big pipeline that can handle a large amount of data. I mean, even with a, even with a one gig connection that is specifically dedicated to uploading or downloading hundreds of gigabyte files or multiple terabyte files are going to take hours to download, upload, and to move around your network. And to handle all of this, you need a staff with the expertise to work successfully in these new and in, new and evolving technologies. Of course, that could be said about anything, but it's certainly true of the era we're in now. Um, people need to upscale their, their knowledge of the different formats and what they're getting into, and you need to have the hardware and the software to handle it. Next slide, please. Okay, the importance of QC. This is my area of expertise and to a greater extent, Third Eye Digital's area of expertise. We are primarily a QC company. 
uh, we also create IMF packages and upload those to our um, fulfillment partners. Um, but the importance of QC in the UHD and HDR and immersive audio age. With brighter, more colorful, more colorful and higher resolution images, more can be seen than ever before, including more errors. So you saw the stark difference between the color and brightness and contrast in the SDR image that Ramon showed and the HDR image. Well, you're seeing more colors, you're seeing more light and you're seeing more dark, but anything that's wrong with that image, you're also seeing more of that too. So, um, you know, for example, uh, a piece of production equipment that might have been hidden in the black somewhere in an SDR image now pops right out. That piece of green production tape that was placed there as a, as a marker for the actor, which may not have been noticed or seen before, is now a bright green circle in the middle of the frame because everything is popping out more. Um, a boom mic that might have been lost in the shadows up at the top now is this nice black contrasty boom mic that keeps dropping into the frame. <laughs> um, and, you know, we see this boots on the ground every day that things we might not have noticed in an SDR image just pop like you wouldn't believe in HDR, even stuck pixels. So if you're talking about an HDR image that was color graded at a thousand nit target, that stuck white pixel is popping out at you like someone standing behind a movie theater screen, shining a flashlight through it because the brightness and contrast have been increased. So everything looks better, uh, but the, the issues that we're looking for in QC present themselves much more obviously. And so they're gonna present themselves more obviously to the home viewer. So we try to catch and correct those before they ever get to the, to the viewer at home. The other reason to take that QC step is the increased cost of creating feature rich files means more is at stake. You know, you're working on a 10 episode show where the budget per episode is two to $3 million. At the final stage, just before launch to the OTT platform, you know, two steps before the consumer at home is going to view this content why would you not take that one last step to evaluate what you have and make sure that you know the infamous starbucks cup is not going to be seen in a game of thrones episode there there is no there's no argument against not having the final product qc before upload to the ott platform and before it streams to your home because there's just so much at stake now um, there are automated QC processes uh, that help with basic file checks. Um, many of you participating today know what those are. There are AIs that can detect both stuck and random pixels. There are AIs that can detect framing errors. They get better and better all the time. Um, but there are many errors that can only be found by an experienced third-party QC operator. An issue in a file that is going to disturb a human viewer probably needs to be found by a human. Um, something that is going to lessen the consumer's enjoyment of, of content can only, that can only really be quantified and defined by another human. So the, the human element in QC uh, as far as I'm concerned, will never be removed completely. Um, basic errors need to be caught early to ensure no rejections at delivery. And that's kind of what I talked about earlier when we talk about what is or is not at stake. Um, you finish the show, you're delivering it to the OTT platform. They're going to do some form of QC themselves uh, it only makes sense to catch the most grievous errors before that ever happens. And it also makes sense to catch smaller errors too that are going to bother or 
be seen by the discerning home viewer. There's no reason not to do it. Next slide, please. Um, specifically where Dolby Vision is concerned, we've talked about um, metadata, SDR metadata. Um, in real life, what that means is it's, it's metadata that tells the image how to look in standard dynamic range. Ramon talked about all the statistics about people who have HDR televisions at home and it's becoming more and more, but the majority of people when they sit down on their couch to watch your content, even if it's HDR, they will be seeing it in standard dynamic range. Um, most people still do not own an HDR television, but obviously that fulcrum is, is, is going to change. Um, so it's important to view HDR material with the SDR metadata applied so that you know exactly how this show is going to look on an SDR television. And to my knowledge, no one has come up with an automated way of catching those visible errors other than watching the show in real time with the SDR metadata applied. It presents itself as either a luminance flash or an obvious color change either in the middle of a shot or at a cut. And I have not seen or I've not heard about or seen demonstrated an automated QC process that can catch those luminance and color issues in real time. It still takes a human sitting down and watching it. Where um, immersive audio, uh, Dolby Atmos is concerned, anyone at home who has the ability to decode Dolby Atmos, anyone who took the time and effort to put speakers in their ceiling, or even if they have an ability to pseudo decode Dolby Atmos, you're talking about someone who wants a high quality listening and viewing experience. This is the video file slash audio file person that we all know or may be ourselves. And so again, there's no reason not to QC that Dolby Atmos content to make sure it's right for the home viewer that can enjoy it. Um, quality review by an experienced third party could catch audio and video errors that would detract from the home user's experience. That's obviously been the theme of what I've been talking about for the last two slides. Um, people have UHD HDR televisions now. They have the ability to listen to Dolby Atmos at home. They want a quality audio visual experience and they are going to see and be disturbed by technical errors and production related errors. And those need to be caught before the OTT platform streams it into people's homes. Next slide, please. Oh, who are those handsome devil? Indeed, handsome, handsome devils indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, this is such a fascinating, to me, it's such an interesting topic. I could uh, listen to you talk about it all day and I, um, it's just, I, I'm not a, a, a video uh, technician, but I, I love, uh, it's really interesting to me. One thing as you were talking about this, Tom, that I was thinking about, and, and Ramon as well, um, do you think HDR is kind of a, 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 I don't know, I guess maybe invites a, a new form of the art when it comes to making television and, and movies? Um, maybe not quite as dramatic as the change from from black and white to color, but as an artist, a, a filmmaker, with um, armed with this new palette, do you think it's it's potentially going to change the way um, filmmakers approach what they're doing? Certainly, I, I think it already has. Um, we see content now, and especially period content, meaning shows that are supposed to have taken place in the past. I think cinematographers and directors can now use a more like naturalistic lighting style and still pull all the detail out of the image. Um, I, I, I think they can shoot it with, with more, you know, it, if it's a Western that takes place in 1850, um, obviously indoors at night, 
uh, you didn't have a high key light in 1850 brightly lighting your face. And that's always been a challenge for production people is how do we make this look like the period where it takes place in. I think HDR, um, it, uh, that higher contrast and those deep inky blacks and those bright whites allow people shooting period content to, to really um, kind of expand what they want to do creatively. I can just tell you that, that 4K HDR material captured, shot correctly, and um, colored correctly looks like an oil painting. It can be absolutely beautiful. So I, I would say the answer is yes to your question. Yeah, and if you're, let's say you're a filmmaker or a cinematographer that's, that's used to working in SDR and your eyes somehow have adjusted to that and you know how what you're making is going to translate into SDR, um, is, it, is, is, is there some difficulty in kind of reframing the way you think of things and to, to, to see in HDR as you're, as you're producing, producing something? You have to go back to film school to, to, to be able to take advantage of this? Um, I probably not that extreme, but we, we had a slide that that said what specific hardware would you need to you know set up a, a HDR or a Dolby Vision color suite. One piece of hardware that we didn't have mentioned on that list, and this was an omission on my end, is almost all of the color correction suites now they have a consumer grade monitor there so that they can view what looks beautiful and would bring a tear to your eye on this 1000 nit edge to edge professional color grading monitor. They need to have a reference for what that's gonna look like on a consumer grade monitor. Um, we do that, that's a big part of what we do here in the QC process. We're taking that file that was color graded on a $30,000 1,000 to 4,000 nit brightness professional monitor, and we're looking at it on a on a very high quality consumer monitor to imitate what the consumer's experience is going to be. So I don't think the cinematographer, the director, or the colorist have to completely retrain themselves, but they do need to have tools immediately at their disposal to say, What's this going to look like potentially in someone's home? And um, I think they figured that out. And if you go into a color grading suite, you're going to see some form of a consumer grade monitor there used as a check for, this looks great on a $30,000 TV. <laughs> How's it going to look on the TV that's available? Yeah. To the, the guy? Yeah, that is, that's going to be a hard sell for me, the $30,000. <laughs> like I said, if you have a true, like a 4K Pulsar, Sony X300, um, monitor at home. Uh, I tip my hat to you. <laughs> I want to come over and watch the Super Bowl. With you. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned I could we, I could talk about this all day. Um, if there's anybody um, that's attending, we'd love to hear questions for you. Just t uh, put them into the QA bin, and we'll try to get to them. But um, I want to. We're almost out of time here, but um, I want to talk a little bit about or ask a little bit about the um, the. The size you mentioned that um, that audio files can be a hundred gigs now, yeah. and I mean that's just that just kind of blows my mind when you think yeah. about an audio file being that big, and I think that even even organizations platforms that have really really strong robust infrastructure are are maybe not struggling, but the size of these files impacts their the ability for them to receive them as quickly as they'd like. And when you're trying to get some, you know, on-time delivery to your consumer is a huge part of what you're trying to get done as a platform and as a retailer. It needs to be up there on time because if it's not, you know, you're talking about like day of broadcast or something, someone else has that content, you know, and, and a consumer is not going to say, well, you know, I, I guess I'll just wait for Eric's video to serve, service to get it, um, even though Tom's already has it. You know, consumers are, are they're, they're going to go watch it wherever they can. So it's really important that your infrastructure can manage that. And um, I think your points about QC are super important when it comes to that, that point. You, you get a file, it takes a long time to get there. You spend a lot on it. And the last thing you want is to have something, you know, some ridiculous thing to be wrong with it once it gets there. It can really impact your business. So it's an important, important point. 
Um, well, it looks like we're at time, guys. Thanks a lot. Um, really enjoyed your presentation today. And uh, as always, we can make this available. Um, we will make this available uh, in, um, in, in its full video glory, although we won't have uh, UHD um, and, and HDR yet, but well, maybe it's something we will work on. Um, on. That will be on the OTTX YouTube channel. But I want to thank everybody for jumping on with us today. Uh, to this edition of the Wednesday webinar series. Um, the PowerPoints and the video will be available shortly. Um, also want to invite everybody to join us on October 7th for our next in the series, which is going to be What Are We Watching Tonight? presented by Russ Krupnik. He's the managing partner at Music Watch. Uh, you can register to attend um, at the OTTX.org site. I'm also going to drop a link into the chat right now in the registration page, so you can all jump over there right now. Um, we've also got a couple of upcoming things I want to remind everybody about. We have um, the OTTX Roundtable Discussion Groups. It's going to be on October 28th. Those are really popular, and we have a lot of fun in them. So um, if you're an OTTX member, we'd love to have you join. Um, registration will be available for that shortly. Um, after that, on, uh, on December 10th, it's time for the OTTX at Digital Media Pipeline with our inaugural OTTX Impact Awards. So you'll be hearing more about those uh, very soon. So thanks once again, everybody, for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.